Do we believe that Jesus is coming soon? Amen. Raise a 
talk to you. Thank you. 
completely, completely self-absorbed. And Jesus penetrates to the very core of his being. Jesus touches him. Jesus puts his hand on this man's spiritual pulse and doesn't find him. This man is not confronted with Jesus saying, hey, listen, how do you understand the law? And he answers, well, I need to love God without, this is, this is not Jesus saying it. This is the, the lawyer responding to Jesus' question, what does it say in the law, and how do you understand it? This man says, love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, and with all my mind. And then he adds this little kind of like, oh yeah, by the way, love It's almost like he's concentrating more on the, on the what I need to do to God, to please God, for me to inherit eternal life. And he's less absorbed or less interested about his fellow neighbor. I don't, I don't know if you see that. But he says here, love the Lord with four crucial elements and then love my neighbor as myself. Now, Jesus is wonderful. Because how Jesus responds, it says here, Jesus said unto him, you have answered what? <coughs> right. Correct. And I assume he puffs up his, of course I'm correct, Jesus. I'm a lawyer. I'm an educated man. I'm a smart man. I'm a prosperous man. I'm a gifted man. I'm a wealthy person. I'm a favored person. I'm highly esteemed. My life is good. I'm on the top of the world. Of course I'm correct. I know, I know, it doesn't say all that in this. I know. But I can almost sense that it, that's exactly what he's thinking. Amen. And he says, Do this, you have answered correctly, or rightly, do this, and you might live. Oh, you, you will. But you will have it in your life if you do this. So here's the thing. Without Jesus saying, he's saying. I don't know if I confused you. I almost did be, but I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say something and you, 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 you try to tell somebody something without saying it, but hoping that they get it and they got it. But you didn't say it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I lose God. You with me? Amen. Okay. Jesus says, do this and you will it. The implication that Jesus is giving here, what Jesus is implying is that he is not doing it. Isn't that right? Do you see that? Do this and you will it. But he, this lawyer, he got it. He got the implication. He got what Jesus was trying to get at. He got the, 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 the subliminal message that Jesus gave him. He was offended. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he understood that what Jesus told him is, you ain't doing it. You want to know how I know that? Just read it. Look at what he said. But he wanted to what? Justify himself. Hold up, Jesus. You mean to tell me that I'm not doing it? I'm not loving God. I'm not loving God with all my heart, my soul, my strength, my mind, and my neighbor for himself. He, no, no, no. And he tries to justify himself. So look at what he does. He said to Jesus, he's a lawyer. Do you guys know about lawyers? Uh, they, you're trained. I, I'm not a lawyer, but I might as well be. Because you're trained to turn things around. You're trained to trip up. Trained to deflect. Okay? You're, you're, you're trained. If you're a defense attorney, your whole, your whole defense is to, uh, whatever accusation, to cast it off and place it on someone else other than yourself. That's the whole essence of defending. Defending. To try and acquit. Jackie Cochran status. Okay? OJ Simpson? Mm -hmm. If it does not fit, you must. Yes, sir, for it. It. Hopefully, you guys remember that. Yeah. The whole essence is to try and get off. So he, trying to justify himself, being a very good lawyer, he deflects. He turns the attention. He does like the Samaritan woman. What, 
am I talking about? You remember when Jesus was uh, at, the, at the well? And the Samaritan woman comes to drop water, and Jesus enters into a discourse with her. I'm talking about in John chapter 4, I believe. And, uh, and, and Jesus is there talking to her, and finally Jesus reveals himself to her, and, and she feels conviction because she's says, like, uh, ho, ho, Hold on. Yes, go we'll call you back. No, man, you're right. You have rightly spoken, just like you said to the Lord. Because you've had five husbands, and the one you're with isn't even yours. She's like, oh, snap. <laughs> That's uh, AKA, oh, no. You call it. Okay? And so she's like, hey, 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 you Jews said that the Holy Testament, you know what she did? She completely tried to take off the conviction from her. She tried to take her, the attention off of her and put it on him or something else. So this is exactly what this lawyer does. Jesus is a pro at confronting this kind of... Alright? And sometimes we do that to Jesus. Isn't that right? Sometimes when, when we're confronted, it is square in our face with the reality of our true condition. We tend to... to but, but, but wait a minute. And try to do the same thing with Jesus. We're experts. In fact, it's so much so that right from the very start of this great controversy, instinctively, the very first thing that Adam and Eve do is deflect. What is it that God has God eaten from the tree? Oh, no, 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 no. The woman which you, you gave, she did. Oh. It's your fault, exactly. And then she, he goes to the woman, what is it that you have done? And she's, you know, women are more slick than us guys. Man, is it up. Women, you guys are slick because you say the same thing without saying it in that same way. Like, we stick our foot, foot in our mouth all the time. You know, geez, the animals, the woman which you have given me, she gave me an idea. He blamed who? God. He blamed me, but he didn't stop the woman, baby. The woman which you gave me. So because you gave it to me, she made me, you gave her, you're responsible. The woman blames God, but is much more slick. In the record, the serpent beguiled me, and I did it. But who made the serpent? See, she knew who made the serpent. She didn't accuse God directly, but she did the same exact thing. She deflected the attention. And this lawyer is doing the very same thing. Uh, and he asked the question, and this is where you and I come in. Because the whole essence of the whole, the, the premise of his inquiry, of his, of his uh, wanting to know how to inherit eternal life, hinges on us understanding the, the explanation or the exposition that Jesus now uses to help this man understand the essence of inheriting eternal life. In other words, by us understanding how Jesus directs him, how Jesus demonstrates to him how he can become or inherit eternal life will help us to be able to do the same. You confused? You got it? So he reflects the, 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 the attention. He says, well, who is my, my neighbor? Jerusalem to Jericho was downhill. 
So it's not there. My brothers and sisters going up. If it was the opposite, say he went up from Jerusalem to Jericho. He went down. So this man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now he's obviously alone. Now, I'm reading this in verse 9, you might not realize that this is a dangerous road. From Jerusalem to Jericho, there was, there, it, was, it was customary that there would be robbers and thieves and, 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 and assailants throughout that road on the way down to Jericho. Because they know that you, you're coming from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in New York City. You're coming with merchandise. You're coming from prosperity. You're going down into the valley. You're a merchant. You're somebody that's wealthy. You're somebody that's prosperous. And so they're preparing to ensnare you. This man is going alone. That's a no-no. There's not a neighborhood here in, in Cleburne that is a no-no, right? No, not here. I remember the first job that I was called to do. I went to go to an event business series eight years ago in Closet Road. The road. You guys don't know what I'm talking about. That's a, that's a neighborhood in Dallas, one of the worst in Dallas, right next to Wall Street. My first night there, I heard what I thought were fireworks. They weren't fireworks. They were shots. This man is heading down to Jericho, and as he goes, he falls among thieves, of course. And these thieves, these thieves stripped him of his fall. So now he's what? He's naked. Yeah? They stripped him of his clothes, they wounded him, and departed, leaving him half. Half dead. Half dead. He's hanging on for dear life. And there, there isn't a med center. There isn't Harris or Hubie or any other hospital nearby. There's no one there to help him. They assume that soon he'll die. They leave him there to die. And his condition is interesting because he's beaten. He's poor because they've stripped him. He's, they, they have, he has no clothes. So he's naked. And obviously, he's feeling distraught. Yeah? It's interesting because Jesus has an illustration or uh, uh, he, he has a message in the book of Revelation chapter 3 to a last day church. <laughs> this last day church's name is, um, well, you guys have heard of the yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus says, I know my words. You, you, you said that you're rich. And increase to the goods and have need of uh, nothing. You know, our lives are, are great here. We live in a place in a place in time where we're not having to struggle to provide for our daily bread. Walmart is right down the road. Albertsons, if it's your ATV, whatever it is, wherever you glean your groceries from, it's very easy. And 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 now you don't even need to struggle. You just pay with plastic. Just that's it. You don't have to worry about the change and the money and all that. No, the money comes directly deposited from my foot into my bank account and all these things. And and I don't know if you're like me, but I'm literally cashless. I, I live in a cashless society. I hardly ever carry cash. So don't even think of robbing me. Just credit cards or debit cards. Credit, because I build up reward points, but. <laughs> this message, this man that has fallen among thieves, is exactly the description that God gives of the last day church. Revelation 3.17 says, because you say that you are rich and increased and have become uh, increased with goods, wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not understand that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's our condition. That's our condition. That's, how, that's, that's who we are. And 
Jesus uses this illustration, this parable, this analogy to help this lawyer understand a very fundamental truth. You're back to Luke chapter 10. Is that right? Continue in verse 30. Then Jesus said, then Jesus said to him and said, A certain man went down from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by certain chance, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. Priest. Believer or not believer? Saint or a sinner? Saint. A saint sinner. Or a sinning saint. He would be a church member. He would be a church leader. He would be an example. Someone that you look up to. Someone you would hear, maybe not with your respect. He came down that very way, came down that road, and when he saw him, you know what he did? He passed by on the other side. On the other side. He didn't, he was coming, he came across that band or whatnot, and then he sees the man on his and he thinks, oh no. He sees him half dead, but he's not thinking about him. He's thinking about his own safety. He's not thinking about the wounded man. He's thinking, oh no, the thieves are somewhere around here. I better get out of God quickly. And he goes on the other side, so he's nowhere near. Hopefully they won't even see him. Thieves. <laughs> Likewise, a Levite. Now what do we know about Levites? They, they, you know, in the Old Testament, back in the Levitical, Levitical, Levitical order, or, 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 the priestly order, right? So first there's a priest, and then there's a Levite. They're both, they both belong to the priestly order. They're both church members. They're, I would say, Seventh-day Adventists. I would say they're Bible-believing Jesus awaiting, Advent hoping Christians. Yeah, yeah. They, this, this Levite says when he arrived at that place, when he got there, he, the Levite does something a little bit different than the priest. He came and looked. He came closer, he looked, he apprehended, he examined, he seen, oh, this man is born, this man is stripped, this man is naked. I should cover him up. No. He came and looked and passed by him on the other side. The lawyer was not expecting this one. But a certain Samaritan. Now that's a derogatory name. That isn't necessarily derogatory. But this lawyer was probably Jew. And the Jews and the Samaritans, you know, they, they, they didn't do much with each other. In fact, they didn't even talk to each other. I would venture to say they probably despised each other. There was some sense of animosity. There was some sense of, of hatred. And for the Jew, the Samaritan was a lower class. Worse than a dog, that's right. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. He didn't just see him from afar. He came up close to the wounded man. He came close to the man in need. He went there because he knew that that wounded man couldn't come to him. Hmm, that's interesting. He came where he was, and when he saw him, it doesn't mean that, uh, obviously he saw him in order for him to come to him. What it means 
when it says, and he saw him, means that he seen his condition, how badly wounded he was. When he saw his true condition, it was just, he just seen a man out on the road. When he comes close and he sees the blood, he sees the lacerations, he sees the wounds, he sees the man thriving in pain, just literally hanging out for dear life. He had compassion. Do you know what compassion is? It's an incredible, tender pains. It's a it's a, a a sense of helplessness, not necessarily helplessness, but you you see someone in in that condition, and you just think, that could be my son, or that could be my daughter. You know, you start to internalize, it start, it starts to process in your mind the, 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 the scope of this, and, you, and your heart goes out to this person with tender mercy, tender pretty love, to this Samaritan, to, to this probable Jew, had compassion. And his compassion drove him to do something. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds. Now, I don't think that this good Samaritan was a nurse. I don't think that he was traveling with a first aid kit. Johnson & Johnson, band-aids, and you're, you're all your little anesthetics and, 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 and antiseptics and, and all these <laughs> I don't know what he used. Probably he took some of his own garments off. He had to improvise with whatever he had. It says that he bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil and water. Those are two costly things. He didn't think, oh, this is going to, this is going to come. This is probably what he was uh, going to sell. I don't know. I'm just thinking out uh, loud. But he took of his self and he gave to this man that was about to die. He did whatever it took to preserve life. Are right? you seeing that? Yes. He poured oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal. He didn't set him on some insignificant little lower, not lower class. This man, this Samaritan, was probably a wealthy person. He was probably driving a Lexus or an Infinity. Hey, he might be American. A Buick. And he didn't have a cat, of course. Woo! Where was that? Yeah. Hummer. Okay, that's American name, right? Not really, it's in China somewhere. It has to be. Right? It's not on the, uh, everything in China. So he puts him on his own horse. He didn't think, I'm going to get blood on my car. I'm going to get my, my this is going to impact me. This is going to cost me. This is, he didn't think about that. He did whatever it they had to take to preserve this life. Now, there's, there's a meaning and, and a purpose behind all of this if we desire to inherit eternal life. That is. So then he sent him on his own animal brought him to an inn, and what did he do? Now think about it. You thought that you just took him to an inn and took off. No! This Samaritan goes into the inn, finds the room, takes him in, probably takes him in the shower, cleans him up, and takes care of him. Come on, we need to eat, drink a little bit of water. He takes care of him for at least a day. He didn't stop there. It says, 
And the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. He made provisions for him, even in his absence. This man goes above and beyond the call of duty, according to today's standards. Yes?
the door from the other side. How would you feel if they're from down the lodge says, listen, I'm sorry, we, we, we can't find someone that's willing to do that. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if we can comprehend the times that we are truly living in. In fact, th th this kind of, th this sleepless, not sleepless, this, this kind of somnambulism, you know what that means? There's this state of, uh, of sleepfulness. Not lethargy, lethargy or lethargy. I'm learning English. It's all right. This is is one of the characteristics of living in the last days when we are asleep. I, I ask him to turn to Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah chapter six. And listen to what God is calling us to do here, Isaiah. You're going to the 60th chapter of Isaiah. And I want you to look at what it says here. I'm going to take a long time to get there. Because this thing is super, super, super slow. Isaiah, are you in chapter 60? Look at verse 1. It says, Arise and shine for what? Your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. This is a prophecy of the last days when God is infusing in his people his glory. When God is infusing us with, with, with the power, with not just Latter-day power, but actually the power of Pentecost, the former rain and the latter rain. God wants to fill us with that kind of power so that we can light the world with the glory of God. But in order for us to receive the light, we need to first arise and shine. Now, if we need to arise, it implies that we are in what state? We're asleep. We're lying down. We're taking it easy. We're not doing much. Well, you know, we might give an invitation here. We might give a word there. We might say, God bless you. And sometimes we come, we, 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 just because we said, oh, blessings to you. Good Christian. Brothers and sisters, the end of the earth is upon us. Do you know what Daniel 12 wants us? Daniel 21 says, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the prince, the great prince that stands for the children of that people, and there shall be a time of trouble, ah, such as there never was since there was a nation. We're, we're, how many of you are looking for Jesus to come? Amen? How many, even by man, right? After this, we're awaiting Jesus to come in the, glory, in the clouds of glory. We, we want that day. We're, 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 we're hoping that if we sing about that day, when we all get to heaven, what a glory, what a, what a day of rejoicing that will be. It's my favorite hymn. Praise the Lord for all of that. Let me tell you, before that great light and glory is day, the earth will go through its darkest night. Are, you, are, are we conscious of the reality that things are not going to get better Amen. on this earth? Do we realize that we are literally living on our times and the mercy of God is still holding back the four winds of strife? Understand what will soon take place on planet Earth. Not to frighten anyone, it's common moves, but of all the places for Ebola to go in America, it comes to Dallas first. <laughs> Out of all places, we have it in our backyard. Now, right now, we can sort of laugh about it, but this can easily get so far out of control.
We are living in Earth's most solemn times. And I will tell you, as Jesus told Judas, what thou doest, do it quickly. Because the curtains of liberty and the opportunities and the prosperities that are still afforded us today will not be there for very long. Today, we can open these doors. Today, we can invite people to come. Today, we can preach God's message in its entirety with the first eight angels, the second angels, and yes, the third angels message with clarity and conviction without fear of reprisal or, or uh, fear of imprisonment. That window is soon to close. I, I've got to tell you, God wants to do something great. Not just in Cleveland, but at this church. Amen. He wants to do something incredible in your life. He wants to do something extraordinary in your experience. And he wants to give you evidences that he can use you to do amazing things. We're about to start an evangelistic series. We're about to be, we're about to begin a, 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 a large campaign to try and preach God's word with power and with conviction. We want to bring people of this community to the knowledge of God's saving truth. We want to do that. Now, 
the approach, the mechanism. There's two methods. One of them is prior. What do you do before these meetings? And there's just basically two things. And so late in the game, you can do this. One is prayer. I trust and hope that you've been praying, that this has been at the top of your prayer list, and don't. Just because we start today, doesn't stop. We actually need prayer. Prayer to block this meeting. But even here in the hall, in the sanctuary, as you come, and as you hear the messages, they're the only visitors that are going to be among us. You need to pray during the message. Please, Father, impress their hearts. So prayer is very important in so many, in so many regards. I wish I had more time. I gotta go quickly and cover this. Number two, you can invite. I know you've already invited, but I'm sure you can give another last-minute call. Hey, I just want to invite you tonight. You can't miss it. The first night, opening night. You you won't want to miss this. This is gonna be an exciting event. I don't know how, I don't want to give you my words, but they're my words. Right? You Get them to come however you possibly know how. But do something. Call them, write, stop by the house. Do whatever you can to get them to come. And set us, invite them out to dinner. You can do that, right? And not, maybe not everybody. It's all right. Invite them over to the house and get some popcorn or something. I don't know what to talk about. Do something as an example. Think of creative ways. Pray to God for ways that you can have to invite and give your friends. Families, co-workers, to be here tonight. If there's ever a possibility, and if there's ever an opportunity to do this. Now, during the meetings, this is where I want to spend just a little bit. During the meetings, during our time, we start at 7 o'clock. So that means we should be here at about 645. 6.15. I'll be much earlier than that. So the first one is to be present. Have you made a commitment that you're going to hear every night? I hope so. I hope that your time is not in vain and that uh, whatever does take you away from here, it's, uh, it, well, that's between you and the Lord. There's three ages. Three ages. Number one is be helpful. When you come, you are a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You are a member of this church, and even if you're not a member, if you're a visitor, if you're an Adventist, you are part of the family. Amen. And in a family, we all take care of each other, right? We all pull our own weight, yes or no? Amen. Yeah, that's how it should be. That's what keeps our home going well. Well, so our, our, our church home as well. So when you come, be helpful. There might be something you can do. Be observant. Be ready an instant for if someone need something and I need to have these papers, these decisions cards cut it or hand it out. What we're going to do is put the decision cards on those nights that we're going to make decisions. They're going to be decision cards on, on the insides of these pews. Well, that takes time for people to cut them and people to put them. You might come a little early. You might say, hey, listen, I, I want to help in whatever small way I can. I don't want one person to have the whole load. What's easy is if we all take a little and nobody's overburdened. You see, we, 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 we don't realize that church is usually five to ten people that are the ones that are doing the work for the whole church. Maybe more. No, sorry. This church is very active. We have a lot more. But there's a small percentage of people that are actually working. And many times you're overworked because you're, you have so much responsibility for your department. And when you ask somebody for help, everybody's busy. We gotta get off of that, people. We gotta help. We gotta do something. There's something we do. If you can't cut, if you can't, you can pray. I'm here for the prayer room. We're going to have a room for prayer. Is that all right? We're going to have a box out here. I think it's already there. There's going to be two boxes in the back there. One of them is for questions and answers. The other one is for prayer requests. We're going to take prayer requests night after night after night. And we're going to pray for those prayer requests. And we want prayer room that will be praying for those prayer requests. People are going to come with real issues and real problems. You have no idea the issues that people are confronting. And they don't make it known. But they write it on that piece of paper. Maybe it's something insignificant. But the Lord knows what that is. We want to pray for them. And we want the Lord to intervene on their behalf. So those boxes are there. The other box for questions. During the meetings, people, special visitors, and even you, might have a question that pops in your mind. A question related to the topic. A question remaining, uh, pertaining to spiritual things. We want, Pastor Harley and I, are going to get five minutes every night, beginning night number two, as, as the questions come in, for questions and answers. We're going to take those questions and we're going to ask them out of the Bible. We'd love to do that. We want to have, to have people help people to understand the Bible and, and these truths that we're, we're learning. So we're going to have to, uh, another box for questions and answers. We have the prayer room. Uh, be helpful. There's different areas. There's greeting. There's ushering. There's 
special music. There's so many different dynamics. There's technical uh, uh, things here. There's a, a whole different host of different areas. There's children's department. You might just go in there and just sing one song, okay, two or three nights a week. Just do something. Get a hold of this. Jackie, that'll be at the end of um, Yes, please. If you're willing to do something, meet with Jack and get signed up, get plugged in so that you can be uh, an active participant, not just a spectator, but you can actually be a doer. Right? So number one is be present. Number two, the, uh, one of the three H's is be helpful. Be ready to be helpful. Yeah. Number uh, uh, the second H, be hopeful. Be hopeful. This is not our effort. We learned in our evangelistic series that we ought to cooperate with. We should never conjecture as to the, the success of our, our most honest endeavors. We ought to cooperate with one who what? Knows no failure. Those that came to the evangelistic meeting, uh, uh, training, uh, re uh, remember that. We cooperate with one who knows no failure. This, these meetings will not be a failure. And it isn't going to be a failure because of the speaker or of the organizers. It won't be a failure because Jesus Christ is at the center of these efforts. And he will surely bring it to success. Number three, the third age, be happy. Happy and optimistic. Come in through all that door with a smile on your face. Don't be like some of those sad dentists that seem like they were baptized in lemon juice. You put your best smile when you come through these doors and you say hello to everybody. As many as you possibly can. You might be surprised. You're going to get to meet some members that you didn't even know existed. And you know because you sing this fake shadow of the body. But when you come, you actually say hello and you interact in some small way. It becomes that the, your, your, your family members become more real to you. Be happy and be pleasant. Be optimistic. Right? Both to guests and to the hosts. Don't be an Adventist. What, what did I mean? <laughs> Don't be an Adventist. You just told me not to be a sad man. It's not about something. Hey, here's what I mean. During these meetings, we're going to be giving away prizes. Just for instance, just an example. We're going to be giving away prizes. And there will be guests among us. If your name or your number is drawn, please don't say, oh, no, give it to one of the visitors. Don't do that. You are just as important as the visitors, and you will act just as they will. If you win something, you come and you grab it, and you say, thank you very much. And if you already have one of those, then behind the scenes, you find somebody you can give it to. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to make someone else feel all uncomfortable. Oh, the us and them. No, we're all on the same thing. If there is decision cards, I don't want to, my request, you can do whatever you like, but my request is, if the decision card is there, take it and fill it out. You don't have to put you want to be baptized or those things, but, you know, when visitors are coming, they're not doing it. Well, I'm not going to do it either. You see, you're not, you're, you're just as much as a participant as they are. And what I'm trying to say is, be part of it as well. We're going to have a registration. The guests are going to come. They're going to register. It's going to be kind of weird when they come. Oh, are you a visitor? Yeah, you need to register. No, 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 no. You can go straight up. No, 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 no. Everyone comes. Everyone registers. Is that okay? Can we do that? Amen. Is that fine? All right, then please. You know, the registration people in the back, let's not give them a hard time. Okay, say, would you please register? Listen, it would be in your best interest. You just might not know what you might win. There's incentives. So don't be Adventists. Try not to, not to uh, uh, congregate and be in your little place. You know, go outside of your comfort zone and actually go up to a visitor that you've never seen before and tell them, thank you for being here. We're so glad that you come. You represent Restore. Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm with Restore as well. Restore to Whatever you want to say, you want to welcome me. What is your name? Just try to enter into this conversation. And not only that, every night you see them, you come to them and try and remember their name. Statistically speaking, a person is more willing, is more likely to stay at a church if they made at least seven connections with different people. So you, I want each visitor to at least make seven new friends when they come here. Is that something we can do? 
Can you help me with that? They're going to have one in me. They're going to have another one in Harvey. I need five more. Pastor Charles, sorry. Behind the scenes, we're editing on it. That's all I want to Okay, I got to cut it short. What time is it? Oh, yeah, I got to cut it short. Okay. Well, we're almost here to the end. We're almost here to the end. I, I just want to... Uh, um, uh, so, uh, be social. I'll talk about that. Interact with the visitors. Please, don't. Please interact. When they're turning in their Bibles, be observant. You want to see if they know where they're going. Many of them will not know where the book of Nahum is. How many of you know where the book of Nahum is? <laughs> I don't want them to be like, you know, when I say, hey, hey, please, let's turn to uh, Second Opinions, chapter 7. I don't... Second Opinions. <laughs> You guys, please be attentive. Be attentive to what? Be observant. Be observant when, when, when you, know, you might see tears in their eyes. You might, we're going to confront them. We're going to have, we're going to have the time of, of, of joy. We're going to have the time of sadness. And there is going to be a time of maybe resistance. We're going to confront a host of different emotions during our time together. And people, as they come, will probably cry. Be attentive, be observant, be compassionate to them. Come to them, put your arms around them. Let them know you care. Let them know you love them. And you have a special interest in their, for their own good, for their life, for their uh, eternal life. Yeah? Be observant. So let me, uh, let me just explain to you how the meetings will go. We're going to begin at 7 o'clock. At 7 o'clock, you're going to want to be here before 7 o'clock because at 7 o'clock, we're going to begin a feature film. You'll see it when you come. Every night, for the first 10 minutes, we're going to have a film. And each night is going to pick up where the we left off, so you won't want to miss it. You come on the third night, and you miss the second night, you miss it, nobody, you can't be here. I can't be this. No, I won't allow it. <laughs> None of that. You have to watch me with my mom? No, no, she's that way. No, 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 no talk. <laughs> Where are you, mom? Give me that. Give me that. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, after the movie, at 710, we're going to begin with several things. First of all, we're going to have a section called Healthy by Choice and Not by Chance. Healthy by Choice and Not by Chance. What we're talking about is we're going to give them a health nugget, not give them, give you, give us. Okay, how about how we can improve our health? Not just here spiritually, we're here for physical well-being as well. So we're going to have that every night. So I'll help them. After that, we'll have our proportionate answer time and our prayer time. We're going to sing our theme song. We're going to have special music certain nights, not every night. And then we're going to have the message. We hope to have you out of here by 11 p.m. Is that okay? <laughs> I wish I did. I want you to listen to this. This comes from, and I'm finishing part up here. This comes from six uh, uh, testimonies of the church, volume six, page 255. It's your thought for our meditation and meditation in the bulletin. It says here, how nigh and afar off are souls, not only the youth, but of all ages, who are in poverty and distress. Oh, including here too. Some uh, sunken and sing and weighed down with a sense of guilt. It is the work of God's servants, like the servant of God. Then it is your work, it is our work to seek, no, uh, it, yeah, it is our work to seek for these souls, to pray with them, not just for them, it says to pray with them and for them and lead them step by step to the Savior. Step by step to the Savior. That's our great privilege. And for the next two weeks, we will have 14 different steps 
who in need are friends or family, even our enemies, lead them to and lead them through. Pray for them, pray for them, work for them. Give of yourself to the master. Give of your all to him. Have ask him to lead you to someone that will impact and a human. Uh, you, listen, I don't know about you, but I want my problems to be so heavy, I'm going to need to carry that. And I want you all to have a combat as well. Or even more. But we have a work to do. Let's do it. Amen? Amen? So that when we march into Zion, we can march in and rejoice in I ask that we turn to that, to march into Zion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.